everyone to our webinar launching the Climate Change and Family Business Report uh, in the MENA. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone here. My name is Farida El Agami. I'm the General Manager of the Tarawat Family Business Forum, and I will have the pleasure of guiding you all through um, this um, webinar today with some fantastic guests and insights from our report. Before we start, uh, even though everybody is by now an absolute ultimate expert at webinars, um, I wanted to uh, point you towards uh, three ways you can contribute and participate to our webinar. Uh, of course, please use the chat function if you want to speak uh, to our, um, to our uh, speakers and panelists. Uh, feel free to use the Q&A function to ask us questions. We would very much like to encourage everyone uh, to share your thoughts and ideas. Um, and perhaps you would even be interested in participating in some of our polls that we will uh, run throughout the webinar. If you have any issues, please feel free to um, contact uh, our um, team at Tarawat, of course. So with regards to our program today, we have a really interactive and varied program for you um, to kind of illustrate uh, the last, I would say, eight to nine months of work that we have done behind this report. Um, we will have a welcome address by uh, our main partner. Um, I will introduce the speaker in a moment. Then we will have um, a panel discussion with three of our main contributors uh, to the report and members of our editorial committee. And then we will also have a little discussion of the outlook of what's going to happen next. But without any further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Huda Rustamani, who is the director at uh, AW Rustamani Group, and who has been an instrumental partner um, at this, uh, at, for this report, to um, say a couple of welcoming words to our audience. Welcome, Huda. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. In this session, uh, I would like to start by thanking Farida Al Agami and uh, the team of Tarawat, as well as the team of Global Compact Network, uh, New AE, for the effort they put together to produce this amazing work and uh, this enlightening report on uh, climate change and the role of family businesses. Uh, uh, in paving the, the future uh, in this area for our next generations. Um, we at uh, AWR Group are very much committed to sustainability uh, as a strategic uh, pillar in our ESG. Uh, and uh, it's a very important area uh, for family businesses to find uh, an opportunity in it and a purpose and uh, you will find uh, this uh, in, in the report through the experience of uh, uh, other uh, businesses and uh, how they went about it. So uh, I would encourage everyone to look at this report and uh, get as much uh, learning from it. It's uh, the small steps that we all take together that will make the bigger impact. And uh, uh, this is uh, an area that we all should look at and uh, start seeding it for the future our, of our next generation. So uh, thank you, Farida and the team, and uh, look forward to see the report now with you. Thank you so much, uh, Huda, for, for those warm words. And I would like to extend our thanks as well to your, you and your team. Um, it's truly amazing that a family business from the region, you know, has, has, has taken uh, this topic on and has uh, supported what is for the first time, at least from what we can see, that we bring these two topics together and really discuss what is the role of family businesses going forward. So thank you very much for, for your right. trust and for thank your you. support. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So thank you so much for that introduction. Um, now, of course, all of you are here, um, hopefully, because you're curious to know what this report is really about. And so without any further ado, um, I'd like to take the next couple of minutes to really um, introduce what the report um, 
it looks like, what it, what it contains, and some of its um, takeaways, let's say, before we get started with an interactive conversation where you know, all of you are most welcome to participate in. So this is our report. Um, we wanted to make sure that it both reflects you know, uh, kind of the critical side of things as well as the hopeful side of, of the situation and look at uh, both risk and opportunity of the realities we are facing today. So as you can see from the inside pages, and of course, all of you are going to receive a link uh, at the end of this webinar, as well as an email with um, the opportunity to download the report. Um, the report is really written for business owners. The whole point is was not for us to kind of recount everything that is already known. Um, we do have um, you know, a lot of scientific facts that we have packaged in a way um, that makes it helpable and interesting for business owners to understand what their role could be in the future. So um, going forward, um, what I'd like to do is just highlight the, three, the structure of this report, because I think it will also then inform a little bit of how we want to run our conversation together. So the first part is, as I said previously, is the scientific part. We've collaborated with scientists from UCL, uh, University College London, to really bring a global perspective of climate change to this, to this report, but yet again, really written in a way um, that is um, kind of digestible and that makes sense in the context that we move. The second part of this introduction um, focuses on the MENA. Uh, we, we believe that we don't talk enough about the regional and even local consequences of climate change. And so we've really broken down those, those global trends into a regional reality. And the third part of this uh, introductory, or the th third section of this introductory part um, talks really about climate change as a risk. And we will come back to this conversation uh, in a bit in our panel discussion. So part one is really kind of laying the groundwork um, with regards to what we are facing. The second part of the report talks about the family business response. So we're both looking at what have families done, what are some amazing family businesses around the region and around the world doing to respond to these challenges, to look at environmental sustainability as an opportunity. But at the same time, we are also um, you know, shedding a critical light on the behavior of family businesses till date and looking at what are the reasons of perhaps a lack of response so far. And the third part is really kind of a culmination of those two previous chapters, which is a practical toolbox. So what we wanted to make sure, and the, the, also our, our um, partners at uh, AW Rastamani Group have em emphasized to make something that is practical for people, that we can go back to, that we can use with our teams. So the last part of the report is a toolbox for business owners um, to help kind of create um, a thought process around uh, environmental sustainability. Very quickly, I'm not going to um, spend a lot of time on this, but it's probably interesting to see how broad this report um, is, is kind of laid out. Um, so we had 12 contributing authors from 10 countries. We had an editor's committee uh, with six editors from across the MENA region. Um, we've created three in-depth case studies, which we will certainly mention uh, throughout the conversation, um, where you can really read on a couple of pages how these individual families um, have very much um, focused and, and how they have taken decisions uh, in on their environmental journey. So we have uh, the pleasure of having the Shalhoub group um, who has given us very interesting numbers and insights on their environmental journey. We have the L'Oreal group, which is an amazing honor to have had that an insights from such a global conglomerate. Um, and we had the Arigoni group from Chile uh, to also look at a, a company that basically has taken environmental challenges and recreated their business models around it. But we didn't stop there. We also profiled 21, what we called champions of change from the MENA region. So from across 10 countries in the MENA region, we have 21 family businesses who have uh, participated and have been nominated or that we have researched who are doing amazing things to respond to our climate crisis. And of course, the mentioned toolbox and the whole report has uh, come up to about 90 pages. 
uh, the methodology, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it was a mix of different types of methodologies of research, including interviews and, and different collaborations with, uh, with experts. So what is the whole um, vision for this report? So of course, um, we would not want to stop here. Um, the report is, is, is just the starting point for Sarawat to talk about this question and to talk about this topic um, at, at much more length. So the way we look at it is that what now that we have kind of closed uh, COP27 and there's a lot of debate about you know um, the future of, of COP conferences as well and kind of their impact uh, going forward. But what we think is that on the journey to COP28, and it's amazing that both of these conferences, um, so the conference of the parties, of course, um, is, are taking place in the Arab world, is it, it gives us a unique opportunity. We think that with our report, we can really, as a community, contribute to kind of changing the narrative and changing um, the perception both of family firms who to be a partner in this process, but also the perception of owners of how they can play a more positive role um, uh, or an active role in uh, addressing this, this you know, crisis that we are facing as a planet. So this is just to illustrate a little bit uh, what the report is about, and I hope it has given you a little bit of, a, of, a, of an insight. So without any further ado, um, I'd love to introduce our, unfortunately, only three speakers. Professor Alfredo de Masis um, has been um, ill with the flu, unfortunately, and he was not able to join us. But um, I'd love to invite uh, to come online uh, Samar Ibrahim, who's an associate director at Ernst & Young uh, Parthenon, uh, Dr. Basma Azamel, um, who is uh, Group HR GM at Zamo Group in Saudi Arabia, and Ahmad Al Fadel, uh, who is the managing partner at ESG Integrate. And our um, three panelists um, have not only been um, amazing supporters, they were also actually part of um, the editors committee uh, of the uh, Climate Change and Family Business Report. And so it's a great pleasure. Welcome to the three of you, thank you so much for being here uh, with us today. Um, and I'd like to kick off with um, giving you the opportunity to, to the three of you to just give us some introductory remarks about you know, how the journey has been with this report, what your impressions are, and how you see the significance of this report going forward before we go into our interactive conversation. Uh, and uh, since uh, we, we wanna support minorities, here today, we'll get started with Emad <laughs> and uh, you know be egalitarian here today. So welcome uh, to all three of you, and Emad, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Farida. Um, so my name is Emad Al Fadil. I'm a managing partner at uh, ESG Integrate. Uh, we are an ESG um, or sustainability consulting firm uh, supporting clients across their entire ESG transformation journey. I'm very excited uh, to be here today, very uh, excited about the report. Uh, I want to commend uh, Farida, the Tharawat team, and all key stakeholders uh, for the efforts that have been put into this, uh, this wonderful and crucial report, um, uh, one that is extremely comprehensive and, and, and most importantly, it is decision useful to uh, family businesses, not only in the region, but actually globally as well. Um, so uh, as a way to perhaps encourage um, everyone to, to have a look at the report, which will, which will allow everyone to increase their awareness around climate change, but also to, to uh, engage and to actually start getting on that path for those that haven't yet uh, of going and, uh, and achieving a net zero, um, or those that are already on that path and that want to further advance is to use uh, as well the tools that are in this particular report. But as a way to encourage, I just wanted to, to mention a few uh, introductory uh, notes. Um, and first and foremost is that we are all, uh, by default, uh, we have all become part of this climate change, uh, virtuous cycle or circle. And all key stakeholders, if we're talking business now uh, of, of the, the local, the regional or the global economy are somewhere on that path uh, of climate change to net zero. And as you will see, these paths are crossing 
Um, and it is only through a common effort that we're going to able to, to achieve this particular objective. But just to give a, a, a concrete example, what do I mean by, by default, we are now all part of this a virtuous circle, is that if we, let's say, are a, a family business uh, in, in this part of the world, all elsewhere, and we're dealing with a particular bank. Now, the majority, if not all the global banks around uh, the globe have already committed to net zero, so they are on that pathway to achieve net zero by 2050. But the only way for these banks to be able to achieve that particular objective, they must ensure that their loan book is also aligned to net zero, meaning that the only way for these banks to be able to achieve net zero is if their clients achieve that as well and, and, and are on that same pathway. So by again, by default, we are impacted by the bank's pathways if we as companies uh, set these particular milestones and these particular targets, and therefore we have to decrease our greenhouse gas emissions, direct or indirect, one of the main ways for, for us to be able to decrease our indirect green, greenhouse gas emissions is if our suppliers are able to decrease their own, because again, our pathways are interlinked. So this is just to say that we're, we're all part of this uh, uh, circle. The intensity of it yet differs until today, based on where you stand geography, geographically, uh, what industry you're in, if you are in, a, in, a, in an industry that is emissions intensive, then you're probably feeling the heat more than others at this particular time. Uh, so this is something to, to, to consider. Um, the other point that I wanted to make, and, and hence the importance of such a report and the value of it is that the deadlines have been set as opposed to our own corporate strategies, whereby we set the KPIs and set the objectives and the deadlines based on our strategic priorities, the deadlines as far as climate change is concerned have been set for all of us. We are all together aiming to ensure that temperatures do not exceed the 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century as compared to the pre-industrial era. And in order for us to do that, the again, KPIs deadlines have been set. We must cut our greenhouse gas emissions, combined greenhouse gas emissions by 45%, around 45%. And the deadline for that is 2030. And we must cut the rest by 2050. So the earlier that a company gets on that journey, the less of a burden it will be on its operation, the less costly it will be. And most importantly, we always tend to focus on the risk aspect, but this is a historical opportunity for environmentally sustainable businesses to actually build new markets and to actually build new products and to enable that transition to net zero. Sorry, thank you very much, Ahmad, for that very comprehensive insights and uh, fully agreed with, with your point. And, and I think ending on the opportunity point is also something, the tone that we have set with the, uh, with, with the report has really throughout been, you know, let's be realistic. We have to be realistic. We have to be truthful, uh, but then we also have to be optimistic where we can. Um, Dr. Basma, would you like to go next? Sure. Thank you very much, Farida. Uh, I would like to first to thank uh, Tarawat for giving us the opportunity and uh, um, sharing all of this knowledge with the family businesses and everybody. I think this really this uh, uh, subject, the climate change, is, is an important, very important uh, 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 subject to be discussed, um, especially what's happening now it's really quickly and i think everybody has to take the action as quick as they can uh, we used to talk about it for years however now i think it's really the time to take the action uh, in the in the in the report actually what's the, the most important thing that i believe is is the examples that uh, it's shared so i think it is like we can say indirectly it's lead by example so all of the examples that you can see there are some companies who have uh, are well uh, advanced and some are trying so all of these examples will give the family businesses the opportunity to go and uh, have this step and be in the uh, in this loop we can say uh, thank you very much. And as a family business, uh, we are trying hard to uh, to be um, uh, climate in, in the climate change uh, opportunity and having both either in our um, CSR initiatives or in our businesses. Fantastic. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Basma. And I think you're absolutely right. The whole point of the report is to lead by example uh, and not just to you know, theorize about what could be done, what should be done, but to also showcase the people that actually are doing things. Uh, and hopefully you know, that will carry us forward uh, as, as families always learn from families. Yes. And, and I think that's the best way to communicate opportunity. Um, last but not least, Samar. <laughs> Thank you, Farida, and thank you, Sarawat. Thank you to our Rostamani group because honestly, this report has been a breath of fresh air. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, I, I am part of the board of a family group, but I also work with governments around the world and I work with entities around the world that looks at sustainability, sustainability strategies. And for the last couple of years, it's very much been talk, talk, talk. And I think finally it's time for some action. And it's extremely important that family businesses, although there hasn't been much traction. It's interesting because that's in and of itself a paradox because the essence of a family business is sustainability. It's long-term thinking, it's long-term perspectives. And yet we are struggling to take that move and to step into that realm of sustainability. Um, I think what's beautiful about this report is one, yes, the examples that we see from other family businesses that have taken action. And I think what's also beautiful is you'll notice in the different examples, nobody is doing everything under the sun. Everybody is looking at it from the exact lens that's relevant to them. They're looking at it in the bite sizes that they can take. And nobody says you need to start big. And I think that's beautiful. It's beautifully put in through the report. There are different steps. You can start at different levels and there's different ways of taking that journey forward. Thank you so much, Samar, for that summary. And I think what all of you really are saying is, is kind of goes in the same direction. You know, it's, it's, it's about creating a mosaic of actions and not everybody has to do everything. It's not possible and we have to be realistic. But I think if everybody can do what they can, we're already on the right track. So um, let's get started with, um, before we go into the actual uh, conversation, I'd like to launch a quick poll because I know that we have some really interesting uh, companies uh, represented uh, on our call today. And I'd love to know um, if in your situation, in your uh, family business or in, in the company that you work with, do you have a clear environmental strategy with goals and metrics? Uh, and I give you a couple of more seconds to answer. The advantage of being the moderator is that I can see the bar move. And it's so interesting to see where, where things are going. Um, fantastic. Uh -huh. Okay, so let's, I think I'm going to close it here and we'll share the results. So, very interesting. Uh, so, we have 29% who say yes, we have an environmental strategy. So, that's a third, which is really good. Uh, then we have 8% um, who say no, and actually, we, we are not planning to have one. Which is, which is also a choice, I guess. Uh, and then uh, most people, which is to be expected, are saying no, but we are working on it. Uh, and I think that that really shows that almost two thirds of our attendees um, are kind of in the process of, of developing uh, something going forward. So um, once again, I'd like to encourage everyone, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to join us. Uh, but I have a couple of questions for, of course, our fantastic panel here. Um, and I'd like to start with uh, Ahmad. Um, so Ahmad, you know, we, we loosely um, talk about climate change and risk. And I think it's, it's really something that um, seems to me, specifically in the business world, not very well Position. So, you know, it's hardly, I hardly see, for example, board risk committees having climate change on their agenda, right? So, what I'd love uh, for you to explain to us is what is climate risk when we look at it from a business perspective? Could you, could you deep dive a little bit with us on that? Absolutely. Um, so, there are two ways to look at uh, climate change, but also ESG in general, by the way, and sustainability. Uh, as, as a company, um, you can look at it from an in to out way and, and an out to end. So when we're talking about climate change, if, if a company is looking at this from an in to out way, then uh, the company is looking at its carbon footprint, at how it is impacting the external environment. 
And that's where you compute your greenhouse gas emissions, which is not an easy exercise to do. And then this is how you quantify your impact on the environment and hopefully work to reduce it and uh, uh, eliminate it. So that's an in to out. An out to in way to look at it is to look at climate change, look at perhaps different scenarios that I will talk about and see how is that going to impact your business? How is that going to impact your entire value chain, in fact? And when we look at it from that perspective, Generally speaking, climate risk is divided into two, to two buckets or two elements. First, there's that physical aspect, physical aspect, which would be tied to extreme weather events. So this would be uh, precipitation, uh, droughts, the rise um, in sea levels, um, uh, so on and, and so forth. And of course, this uh, can and would uh, impact perhaps your, the assets of your company. It may disrupt your production, for instance, or cause other uh, measures, for instance, disrupt the supply chain of your business, not allowing you to conduct your business as, as you may wish to do so. So there's that physical aspect. But then there's that transition aspect, which is very much also intensifying across the globe. What would that include, for instance? This would be policies and any legal requirements. So we are seeing now countries enshrining climate change as part of their legislation, as part of their policies, hence, forcing companies to get on that pathway uh, at, a, at, a certain, uh, at a certain pace. So there's that policy and legal aspect. There's technology. Technology is uh, um, an, an enabler for that transition. So we are seeing uh, many uh, uh, companies, especially those that are, that are at the lead, are using innovation to enable that transition. For those that are not, certainly this would be uh, a risk that they need to, to, to look at. Uh, but there's also market issues. So can be mm -hmm. consumers' behaviors is changing. So a particular product, they're, 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 they're much more mm -hmm. conscious about these issues and they're demanding from those companies from which they're buying their products to, to have an opinion, uh, to have a clear plan in that regard and to ensure that their products are as well sustainable. And there's also that reputational aspect that, that needs to be uh, looked at. Um, but perhaps let me bring in just one or two examples, concrete examples. Um, so this part of the world, the majority, if not all of governments now have committed to net zero by 2050. This has been recent. And obviously, many now are looking to embed that as part of their strategies. And this is going to trickle down to, to companies. And this is something that will be felt on the ground sooner uh, rather than later. Um, but let's say you're positioned in a country where it has made a commitment, but not yet impacting you. But if you are a company, for instance, that is today exporting to the European Union, then, and this comes back to my earlier note about that, that virtuous cycle, then the EU in, in a couple of years time is going to be imposing a carbon tax on EU, mm. non-EU manufacturers uh, and, and importers. And this is because the EU is, is leading the way as far as climate change is concerned, forcing EU manufacturers to get on board, which is putting them at a certain disadvantage in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in order to prevent any of them to leave the EU, manufacture elsewhere where perhaps climate change is not part of policy, they're making sure that they will tax non-EU manufacturers on the products that they will export to the EU. So whether you are now directly impacted or not, there is an indirect impact whereby you're going to have to do something in relation to that. As a final example, looking at real estate, this is a real estate, real estate intensive uh, region. Um, if you look today at what's happening in Manhattan, if you are an owner of a, a building that is above 25,000 square feet, then you are limited. So the, the, you, you are limited to a certain amount of greenhouse gas emissions that that building can generate. So as an asset owner, and this limit, by the way, is going to decrease with time, forcing all these asset owners to ensure that they get these buildings to be uh, net zero ready. So it's, 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 it's very important really to, to assess all these risks, the report definitely helps in that regard to see how your business is going to be impacted and to have a medium and long-term view about things because we, we different geographies, different jurisdictions uh, and different parts of the world are at, at, at different uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, progress along that journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Imad. Um, uh, Samar Basma, do you have any comments um, around this question of risk, because uh, one of the reasons why we actually created together with Ahmad a special um, section about risk in the report is because um, we did feel that um, climate change 
in, in, in our region is kind of perceived as this global phenomenon. It's kind of far away. Um, it's, it's, it's a big thing. So what can I do? And I don't think it's going to affect me because our life is difficult enough. We literally had family business leaders tell us, Farida, look, we, we live in a region or we work in a region that is complex enough. I cannot also like help with this. And then when I try to turn around the conversation and say, but hang on a second, isn't it us who are helping you? Because you're probably blind to a certain risk that might actually start increasing um, and have impact, like uh, Mad said. I'd love to hear your thoughts, uh, Basma, or, or I don't know who wants to go first. I, Sama, I can go ahead. Um, thank you. So honestly, it's, it's good to be aware. I mean, look at what happened with COVID. We were not all prepared. This is a risk that nobody had planned for. And everybody assumed that they had their supply chains were running smoothly, that everybody was connected. And then overnight, something stopped it. So when you're starting to look at not just your business operations within your own walls or within a certain region or a jurisdiction, you need to start looking at your supply chain. The biggest risk is coming in from your supply chain, understanding where are the different hurdles, the different stopping points. Because yes, we might not have um, overflow of, of rain in this region, <laughs> which will cause a flood and cause disruptions. But you know what, where you're supplying the rest of your, your material might. Um, the same thing with drought, the same thing with many other components when it comes to environmental impacts on this, on this world. You are not sitting in isolation. I think we both realize or we all realize that globalization connects us in a different way. So that risk of understanding where your supply chain, supply chain lit, sits and how you can mitigate those risks, I think is a good starting point. Thank you so much. Um, Basma, did you want to contribute? Yes, yeah. sure. Um, actually, um, what Imad and Samar has, has said, it, it covers a lot of things. I think one of the things that really we, we even have to focus on is uh, educating the next generation of the importance. So when they begin working or they begin uh, looking for the businesses, I think it's really it's important for them to be focusing on these uh, climate change uh, businesses and uh, what's important okay. for the environment. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, let's close this conversation just by looking at what the report summarized uh, the risk for, for the MENA is, because I think we like to look at climate change, as I said before, as a global problem. Uh, and once someone said, but Farida, we already have a desert. It's not going to get worse than that, right? But, but I think that really is, is, a, is a big kind of diminishment of, of all the challenges that we will be facing. So on the one hand, there is a prediction that there's about an increase regionally, not of 1.5 degrees, but of four degrees uh, in our region specifically. So imagine, I mean, we're higher than what even the average is expected to be. I think a very important point also from a geopolitical perspective is that of the world's 17 most water stressed countries, 12 are in the MENA. So we, we are extremely water stressed. And I think that is also something that family businesses, we all use water in whatever form for our companies, for whether we are in manufacturing or not, doesn't really matter. Water is essential to our operations. So I think that's really important. Of course, rising sea levels. Rising sea levels is, is a challenge we have huge coastal regions, uh, areas in our region, which can be impacted by the rising sea levels. And I mean, if you imagine that um, the MENA is home to 6.3% of the world's population, but only has access to 1.4% of renewable fresh water. Again, water stress is, is, is you know, reiterated. And I think this one is really also another one that we underestimate is that we, we, we live in a wider region where, where geopolitical stress has caused a lot of displacement of, of people. And if you think that uh, climate disasters already now account for the displacement of about 7 million people per year, um, that is something that we don't really talk about. And also the impact on um, you know, physical damage and, and you know, human lives that um, climate change is having today. So I think it is really important, which is why we wanted to kick off uh, with this somewhat difficult conversation around risk and kind of what it means for us, uh, what we are dealing with really in terms of the reality of our, uh, of our world. So um, let's then move on a little bit and talk more concretely about family businesses, because that's really why we are here today. I think we're all now aware that obviously climate change is a challenge that collectively we have to deal with. But 
um, you know, specifically, why did we bring this into the context of, uh, of the family business community? Uh, Professor Alfredo, who unfortunately is not with us today, actually did a really interesting study that we profiled also in the report. And he, he uh, used data from around 2000 family businesses um, from across 45 countries um, and um, 19 industries and looked across uh, 18 years, um, sorry, eight years, how they were doing with regards to um, family business, uh, in, in, with regards to sustainability. So I'd love to hear from our audience um, what they think before we go into this conversation. Do you think um, that family businesses are better, worse, or the same than their non-family peers um, when it comes to environmental sustainability? So are family businesses amazing? Are they the best? Do they do everything right? Or do they just sit at home and not do anything? I'm very curious to see uh, the results. This is, this is going to be a, a tough one. This is a head-to-head -head race. I can already tell you that. Okay, let's see. Okay, so we have 46% who are optimists who are saying family businesses are better. 21% uh, who are who say that they're worse and 33% um, who say they are the same. So a little, I mean, almost, I would say equally distributed. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts before giving uh, the comments from the, from the report's perspective. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this result. Um, let's start with, uh, with uh, Samar. Any, any comments on this, uh, on this outcome of the poll? This, the outcomes are actually expected. I mean, coming mm -hmm. from a family business, you constantly hear, we have other priorities, we have other investments we need to make, there are other things we need to worry about. When the market asks for it, we'll run with it. So I honestly, I'm not surprised. But I think what's also interesting to see is there are some family businesses that are at par. And this is no longer just a government's agenda, no longer just the big player's role. Family businesses have just as important a role, if not more important. Um, so it's it's interesting to see that that transition is slowly shifting towards the positivity mm -hmm. of family businesses doing something. Basma, any thoughts? Yes. So um, so looking at the, at the family businesses and what's happening there, I think the as Imad uh, have mentioned the, the supply chain and all of their strategies. These are the things that affect them uh, from having a very strategic uh, thoughts. However, I think whatever it's now all of the education that's happening and all of the we can say even the conferences, the governments, everybody is really focusing on this uh, uh, issue. I think it's one of the strategies that uh, family businesses might shift and begin thinking of seriously not only as you said just talks and uh, without implementing the reef absolutely yes um so before i go to Ahmad, i want to mention that uh, alfredo's professor alfredo's research has actually shown that family businesses underperform uh, so that's the bad news i have to give everyone um he would obviously maybe we can do a webinar with him uh, later on where he can explain to us what why um, family businesses are underperforming, but when you read the report, you'll see him answering some of these questions uh, and also give some some hints at as to um, you know what can be done to kind of improve the situation. Um, I don't know, Emad, would you like to comment on on this point as well? Sure. So I think there's going to come a time, hopefully sooner rather than later, when everyone more or less is aligned and is at the same pace. Uh, uh, to hopefully uh, reach that 1.5 degree objective. But until then, you have some stakeholders that are going about it uh, at, a, at a faster pace than others. And, and, and one of the main reasons for that is, is just simply put, is because some feel the pressure more than others, is perhaps because some are in a position whereby there are multiple drivers that are pushing uh, these particular companies to go a certain direction. Mm -hmm. So to give an example, though some of those companies that are most advanced in their ESG or climate change journey are listed institutions. And this is because listed institutions must 
report on their on their financial uh, performance at the end of the year and now they have to report on their sustainability performance mm -hmm. so that by itself makes them that they need to uh, take certain steps and then whenever you find governments coming in stepping in and, and introducing climate change policy and enshrining it into into legislation they usually start with the larger uh, institutions, institutions in particular sectors. So you'll find th those naturally more advanced than than others. Uh, so it, I, I think it's it's a natural it's a natural phenomenon. Institutional investors have been playing an incredibly big role. So if you try to look and see where are they mostly invested, these large institutional investors, you'll find that their investee companies are more advanced than others. But it is, I, I think, a matter of time uh, where when when everyone is going to be more or less uh, aligned. Mm -hmm. So let's Thank get to some questions. Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to build a little bit on Ahmad's comment. So unfortunately, we see this trend where in regulations and the whole carrying the stake, the tax implications, those are the reasons that a lot of these companies actually make any action towards progress. But it's very unfortunate because by the time these regulations come about, you are no longer ahead of the game. You are part of everybody else doing the exact same thing. That opportunity window that we all see in this space yeah. will slowly start to minimize. So if you're gonna sit around and wait for regulations to drive you to change, you've missed the boat of any potential opportunity. And there's actually a beautiful story in the publication that we have that shows you how regulation really didn't become a burden, but actually an opportunity. And it's wonderful to see that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I wanna to get to some of the questions because I think we have some really interesting questions let me quickly answer uh, Anton's question first, because um, the report doesn't really look at um, the investment behavior of, of families. We're really looking at operational family businesses. Hopefully, thank you for this opportunity, we would love to do a report on kind of climate change and um, the family office side of things. So how do investors look at their responsibility in the future? Um, but so hopefully that's something that will come up. Um, let's start with this question here. Um, I think understanding the risk is something that we struggle with. And I think we've realized that it's a complex matter. It's a complex uh, issue that we have to face. And our attendee here asks, should uh, governments or other stakeholders help the private sector kind of understand those risks better? Do you have any thoughts around that? What could be done to, to make it easier for, for busy companies to kind of include, naturally include, climate risk as, as part of their thought process. I don't know, maybe I'll throw that to you, Basma, um, for, uh, to start off with. Sure, uh, it's, uh, for us in this region, I think it's, it's a, it, we are in a very early stage of all of what's happening this year in, mm -hmm. the, in the climate change and uh, the education of it. And, and it's really happy to see in the report how, how much like there are a lot of uh, Saudi and Gulf uh, uh, companies are, we can say in their baby steps of uh, having all of this conversation on on their tables um either we can say as uh, uh, either it's it, it is uh, it is an initiatives or either it's a business matter things that they can have these companies coming and having these uh, important environmental changes uh, happening here in the region so uh, this is what I think about having these uh, differences and having it more uh, um, implemented in the uh, family business uh, companies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts uh, on this point? If I can add a point, uh, sorry, a point here. Governments have actually already started. The fact that you have COP happening in Egypt or happened in Egypt and you have COP happening in, in Dubai the next year, that's governments trying to build that awareness. The amount of, or the flood of questions that have come in from private sector asking, okay, what does it mean? What do I need to do? What's the change? It was fascinating. I've been in this space for a number of years now. And this is the first time where I'm not chasing to explain something to somebody when it comes to sustainability. This is something, somebody knocking on your door saying, please help me understand it. So governments have already started to play a role. I think it's better that we don't wait for that stick to come down and we actually not wait for governments to drive this in a mandatory way. You have a lot of governments like in Saudi, you're looking at anything that's listed on the stock exchange. It's now the reporting is starting to come through. So you see there is some sort of a drive, but I think before you wait for governments to, to put you into check, look at other means, which is what hopefully you'll be able to find in this report. There's other entities, other partnerships that you can build 
that you don't need, governments are there to support and they've started this journey, but I think you also need to help because this is an agenda that requires multiple uh, uh, stakeholders and players. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So I so, think, yeah. Yeah, sorry, ahead, just Zahra. wanted to, to, to build on, on that. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the name of, uh, of, of, the, of the game is engagement. I think it's it's very important for all stakeholders to engage with one another, and and we're seeing that there's no other choice, right? Because again, uh, if if a government is to governments have made commitments to to net zero, but how can they reach that particular objective without the help of the private sector, for instance? It's it, it, it's impossible. So we are seeing that happening on the ground, for instance, whereby again back to that particular let's say bank that wants to uh, reach net zero. Uh, most of the global banks now have an engagement program with their clients. So it's not like they're saying, mm -hmm. um, hello client, in just about two to three years time, we're not gonna be able to serve you unless you have your net zero plan in place, please get it done and come back. They have, some of them have, have, have gone as far as saying those companies that derive, for instance, their revenues, uh, uh, more than 20% of the revenues from coal, uh, related businesses we are we're not no longer going to be able to finance you going forward but for but for everyone aging with them it's about telling them let's 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 have a discussion around this let, let us understand your journey let us understand climate change how can we help you to get on that pathway so we can continue on working together so really engagement is is, is extremely essential and, and and we're seeing it happening on the ground so it's really interesting i think we are at the point in the conversation where i'd like to kind of direct our our gaze into a very concrete direction because i think we've we've established the ground realities that we are facing i think we've established that it's a challenge for the private sector um, and I think that there is a bit of confusion, uh, you know, with regards to what really can be done or should be done. Um, I think this is really um, a very important moment to now shift our gaze towards what 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 motivates humans to change, right? Because at some point it comes to change of behavior, and and I think looking at it as an opportunity is probably the best way uh, to go about it. So um, Basma, I know that you know you work with your board on CSR matters, uh, and you know how can we make sure that we present um, whether we call it uh, environmental sustainability, whether we call it ESG, whether we call it climate change risk. How can we present these topics um, to the family business ownership of today as an opportunity? What can we do to do that? Sure. To be honest, it's uh, as talking about Zamin, and I'm sure it's in all the family businesses. When you come, you when you come to these initiatives that are like uh, it will take a, a huge uh, budget amount of the budget that you have uh, encountered for the uh, CSR initiatives. Uh, I believe having them believe the importance of the environment and what are the changes that's happening, bringing out all of the reports. And thank you for this report with the, uh, sharing with them the, some examples from all over the MENA region. I think these are the most important things that uh, we can share it with the board and they will be supportive uh, if we can. And again, we can say that now everybody believes in the importance of the environmental uh, uh, initiatives and the input that we can do as especially when we talk about Zaman as an industrial company this is one of the things that uh, the, the least that we can do for our environment mm -hmm. thank you basma so um um Samar and ahmad um how do you see that like do we need to kind of how do we incentivize um, you know business owners family business owners more specifically um to to kind of push for this for this not even to push but to look at this as an opportunity i mean Ahmad, you were talking for example about listed companies right when you're listed obviously regulation is very direct it comes in you either comply you don't comply you're in trouble right privately owned companies we we don't feel those consequences that directly so and and i also like what uh, what samar said about the stick why would we have to wait for the stick but if we ask that question, we have to answer it with another question, which is what then? How else do we motivate ourselves to kind of look at this and, and you know, start transforming? And you know, feel free maybe to also go into the governance conversation of how we can use governance as a tool you know, to be a bit more aware of those, of those challenges. Who wants to go? 
Okay, I'll go. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, a little disclaimer, the, the, there's no shame of talking about profitability in a in a climate change uh, uh, webinar, right? Uh, prosperity is one of the three pillars of sustainability, people, planet, prosperity. Uh, but obviously it's profitability that is in harmony with the environment mm -hmm. and 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 where 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 both are contributing to to uh, to to the development of society. So one 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 of the 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 basic ways of looking at all of this is that you as a family business, do you want to remain relevant? Do you want to remain competitive? If you are, there's a transition that is taking place, climate related, uh, 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 social related, uh, governance related that you must engage with, that you must plan for in order for you to remain relevant, to remain competitive, to be able to be involved in those uh, uh, products and services that are going to survive that, that transition. And why not be a leader uh, because there's an opportunity, the, 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 there's going to be a shift taking place in, 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 in competitiveness and, and who's leading various industries, all based on who is planning for that sustainable product that, that consumer, consumers are going to use. But also as a business, it is important for you to attract talent. Yeah. So a talent these days are very much looking into what their a particular company, what their employer is doing in relation to climate change, in relation to sustainability. So do you want to attract talent? One way to do that is to get on board, is to, is to get along that pathway. But also, it's just simply enhances your operational performance as well. If you are saving on use of energy, electricity, and so on, this is going to cut your cost. And, and last but not least, it helps you to, 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 to decrease your cost of capital. Today, increasingly in this part of the world, more so for now in the West, but we are seeing regional banks, for instance, being involved in sustainable finance. Today, you're able to tap onto sustainability-linked loans or to issue a green bond, which uh, do provide incentives in the form of you having to pay you know, a lower, lower interest, lower fees okay. uh, because of that green or sustainable uh, angle. Mm -hmm. Um, Samar, would you like to maybe um, highlight what we've done here in the report? Um, no. So I want to highlight that uh, Samar contributed uh, largely to a, the last part of our report, which is our toolbox. And I think, you know, it kind of puts together a lot of these questions, right, that we are talking about is kind of the how to, what's the first step, what should I take into consideration, or even if I have a strategy, how do I review it on a regular basis and stay, keep it up to date? Maybe you want to comment a little bit on that uh, somewhat. Of, of course. So what we try to do with the toolbox is make it something that builds and grows with you as you grow your aspirations within the space. So not everybody's going to start at the same level. Not everybody is at the beginning. Some people are actually halfway through. Some people are pretty much advanced. So it depends on your own family business. But approaching your board with something concrete is what you need to do. I remember reaching out to the board early on, a few, maybe 10, 10 years ago easily, in which, okay, how was relevant for me? How does this help our business? And you need to be able to answer that question. You need to be able to see how do I weave it in so it is part of the business. It's not this plug and play when I have, then I, I put them when I have time, the effort, the resources. When I don't, I just plug it out. That's not what sustainability is about. And so what we've done, what we've done is we've outlined seven focus points. And these seven focus points, there's a within the toolbox, help you to just gauge your thinking, to align your priorities within the business. How do I make sure that I'm thinking in the right way? When I have the right lens that I'm looking through, you can then frame that approach to your board in a slightly more tangible way, where yes, prosperity becomes part of the equation. The, the financial component is part of that discussion. So the first one that we look at, I'm just gonna briefly touch upon it just so everybody gets an idea of what's in the toolbox. So the first one to accept purpose. Within your entity, your business, your family business, what is the purpose of your business? Everybody has at core a reason why their father, their grandfather, their forefather started this business. Let's go back to understanding what is that for? And part of it might be yes for profit, but there was, I'm sure, a bigger reasoning why it was this type of business and not another one. So understand that purpose and try to see the community component of it, the environmental component. There's always a, a deeper meaning behind it to try and extract what you're looking for. And the second is around alignment. It will have zero impact when you put sustainability or CSR or whatever you want, want to call it on the side. 
and if it's not aligned to your KPIs. You need to make sure that whatever measurements you're doing are aligned to the different directors, managers that you have on board. They know that this is part of your business. It's not an add-on. So alignment and making sure that it's linked to your business is very vital. Third, we come across, which is governance. Sustainability is every single person's job. It's not just the boards. It's not just the CEO. It's not just the person that's heading the CSR department. And honestly, there should be no CSR department, to be very frank, because I feel like that puts the burden on one person. It should not be one person. It should be the mandate that comes from above. And because you have employees like um, like we were talking about earlier, where Ahmad was saying to hire the right caliber of people, they're asking for this. So you do need to make sure that governance models are in place so that it's everybody's job. And then fourth, you're looking at investment. Sustainability requires investment. It does not come by pushing a button. It will not just suddenly appear, you do need to invest. And you need to invest in three different ways. You need to invest in your infrastructure. You need to invest in your processes and in your people, which honestly is one of the most important things that many overlook. The idea of investments is you as family businesses, you are not a CEO that's there for a short amount of time. You're there to lead for a long time and you're leaving behind a legacy. So therefore the investments that you're making are very much a long-term investment with your return on investment coming very much later on. And if you come in with that mindset, you will be able to achieve so much more than what actually non-family businesses are able to achieve because they have a very short-term mindset. Then we come to the fifth point, which is scalability. We mentioned this earlier. I mentioned this earlier. You don't need to boil the ocean right from the start. Walk into your board with the small things that you can do. There are materiality assessments that you can run to understand what is truly material to your business, what is relevant to you as a business, what will impact you that's where you start and then slowly you grow. And if you're starting a small business, you can grow your sustainability agenda with that business. And if you're already a large business, you can start to grow your sustainability scope as you progress in this journey. And it's very, very important to leverage your ecosystem, by the way. You cannot do this alone. There's an ecosystem around you. Try to find the right Absolutely. partners, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we've had the last two points. The first, of uh, the sixth point, which is partnerships. It helps you amplify your actions. There are NGOs that have already done so much of the work for you. You just need to be able to tap into their expertise, their research, their R&D, even their skill sets. It's all there. You just need to find which one is suitable for you. There's other companies that you can partner and collaborate with. So if you're looking at circularity, for example, no single entity will be able to achieve circularity operating in a silo. You need to look at the wider ecosystem of the companies that you can parallel partner with. And then, of course, governments. Governments are looking for private sector to weave in. So that's one of their angle. And the last but not least is transparency. You need to be transparent because, one, you are able to share lessons. We're all in a learning game at this point in time. Everybody's learning and developing and trying to experiment with ways to make this work. So it'll be a great way to create stepping stones for people to, to advance from. And then most importantly, it's you just increase trust. The more transparent you are of what you are able to do and cannot do, the more that trust is embedded in your business. And that just goes a long way on many other aspects than not just sustainability. So that just briefly touches on the toolbox that we have within the, the report. Thank you so much, uh, Samar. And um, we'll, we'll sh uh, shortly post the link uh, to the report uh, in the chat here. And also you'll receive it by email um, after the, the, the webinar. And I really encourage you to go through it this is a dialogue. Um, the whole purpose really of this report is to kickstart a dialogue, is to make sure that as a community, as a community of business owners uh, who in this region have so much influence and so much impact um, that we, we start adding this dimension to our general reflection. And I love what, what basically all of you said, but what also was reiterated by you, Samar, it's not about adding something, you know, having a department that works on this necessarily. It's about transforming our mindset that you know environmental reflections are just part of our general strategic reflections, our operational decision-making, our investment decision-making. It's just an added element that we can, that we can enrich our reflections with that's really how you know how we want to position it uh, going forward as well and um i want to be mindful of everybody's time i'm aware that we haven't really addressed every single question but i think through your comments i think we've covered most of the topics that have come up in in the chat but um before we close i do want to give you the opportunity to maybe you know give us a 
two or three um, you know, statements of what you would wish for this report uh, to happen in the coming weeks and months, uh, and you know, how, how, you, how you would hope our community is carrying this message uh, forward. Uh, let me start with you, Basma. Looking at the report and uh, really reading it, I think it's really our uh, it's it's our responsibility to spread it and let everybody read it. It's really something that uh, I think it will add a lot to them as much as it added to us, and it enlightened a lot of points that, uh, as Summer said, that go and ask. I think this report it's really enlightening a lot of. Uh, things that the private sector are, are asking about or they want these answers uh, on. Uh, it's an, a very important uh, subject uh, to discuss and to read more about and to begin putting it uh, on the table for not only the board, even our employees. Mm -hmm. I think every employee in, in the company has to share, even if uh, in, in a small uh, way, but they have to share something in the environmental and the climate change uh, issues. Thank you very much, Basma. Uh, Ahmad? So, I mean, obviously, climate change is a, is a pressing issue, and it's, a, it's an urgent issue. Um, reading the report certainly will, will, it has increased mine, will increase everyone's awareness around this particular subject matter that keeps on evolving, uh, uh, by the way. And I think whenever one's awareness around climate change increases and reaches a, a certain threshold, then definitely this is going to trigger them to, to act. Um, and I do think that no two journeys are, are the same. Each company will have its own and unique journey. Um, it is okay to go based on your pace and your strategic priorities, but we must have ambitious plans and targets because we have to, we have to reach that 1.5 degree uh, target. Um, so I'll just end with that. <laughs> Thank you. A little bit of urgency there from the mat. <laughs> uh, Samad, go ahead. <laughs> For me, the biggest takeaway is the fact that this is now tangible. It's no longer a concept. It's no longer theory. This report will hopefully put it a little bit more realistic, something that these businesses, as family businesses, can read through and understand what can be done, what are the stepping stones, and the toolbox honestly is just a start. There's so much more that can be done, but at least it'll get you thinking in that mindset, and I think that's what we needed this report to do. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I'd first of all like to thank um, you know all of you for, people have seen you for an hour now, and we have worked with you for eight months uh, to make this a reality, so I'd like to thank you and all the other members of our editorial committee for, for the commitment uh, really that you have made for, for giving this a chance because it's not the most simple topics to bring together and to bridge with each other but I think um, that it's it's a great first step as you said I think it's an opportunity for us to have this conversation and I'd like to thank our partners of course uh, AWR group as well as uh, the UN Global Compact um, UAE chapter for for believing in this for for supporting this with their, their um, you know, know-how, insight, and support. Um, and of course, the Tarawat team for the, for the amazing work and all our contributors, all the 12 contributors who've contributed to this, uh, to this report. I think from our perspective, um, if I can just maybe summarize it in, in a couple of words, what, what we want to achieve is really kind of, you know, for, for us all to see this as an opportunity to collect, connect, to collaborate, and to discuss what the future should look like. So we would like to encourage you to read the report. Please give us feedback, interact with us. Um, our plan is going forward over the coming weeks is to have regular exchanges around this topic and also lead the agenda from a private sector, family owned private sector perspective, hopefully leading up to COP28 that you know, we can be part of these very important conversations and that we kind of expand the, the parties that are involved in these important conversations from civil society to governments to owners from the private sector, uh, not just the CSR officers or you know, uh, the delegates from certain departments, but that owners really feel that it's an opportunity to be part of, of this conversation. So once again, thank you very much. And thank you to our audience who's, who's been with us for, for this past hour. We're looking forward to many more opportunities to connect. 
So all the best to everyone. And we're looking forward uh, to the next opportunity to have this, this conversation. Take care. Thank you very much, everyone.